Book 4. Now the gods at the side of Zeus were sitting in council over the golden floor, and among them the goddess he poured them nectar as wine, while they in the golden drinking cups drank to each other, gazing down on the city of the Trojans. Presently the son of Cronos was minded to anger Hera, if he could, with words offensive, speaking to cross her, two among the goddesses stand by Menelos, Hera of Argos, and Athene who stands by her people. Yet see, here they are sitting apart, looking on at the fighting, and take their pleasure. Meanwhile laughing Aphrodite forever stands by her man and drives the spirits of death away from him. Even now she has rescued him when he thought he would perish. So, the victory now is with warlike Menelos. Let us consider then how these things shall be accomplished, whether again to stir up grim warfare and the terrible fighting, or cast down love and make them friends with each other. If somehow this way could be sweet and pleasing to all of us, the city of Lord Priam might still be a place men dwell in, and Menelos could take away with him Helen of Argos. So he spoke, and Athene and Hera muttered, since they were sitting close to each other, devising evil for the Trojans. Still Athene stayed silent and said nothing, but only sulked at Zeus her father, and savage anger took hold of her. But the heart of Hera could not contain her anger, and she spoke forth, Majesty, son of Cronos, what sort of thing have you spoken? How can you wish to make wasted and fruitless all this endeavour, the sweat that I have sweated in toil, and my horses worn out gathering my people, and bringing evil to Priam and his children? Do it then, but not all the rest of us gods will approve you. Deeply troubled, Zeus who gathers the clouds answered her, Dear lady, what can be all the great evils done to you by Priam and the sons of Priam, that you are thus furious forever to bring down the strong-founded city of Ilion? If you could walk through the gates and through the towering ramparts and eat Priam and the children of Priam Raw, and the other Trojans, then, then only might you glut at last your anger. Do as you please then. Never let this quarrel hereafter be between you and me a bitterness for both of us. And put away in your thoughts this other thing that I tell you, whenever I in turn am eager to lay waste some city, as I please, one in which are dwelling men who are dear to you, you shall not stand in the way of my anger, but let me do it, since I was willing to grant you this with my heart unwilling. For of all the cities beneath the sun and the starry heaven dwelt in by men who live upon earth, there has never been one honoured nearer to my heart than sacred Ilion and Priam, and the people of Priam of the strong ash spear. Never yet has my altar gone without fair sacrifice, the libation, and the savour, since this is our portion of honour. Then the goddess the ox-eyed Lady Hera answered, Of all cities there are three that are dearest to my own heart, Argos and Sparta and Mykonai of the wide ways. All these, whenever they become hateful to your heart, sack utterly. I will not stand up for these against you, nor yet begrudge you. Yet if even so I bear malice and would not have you destroy them, in malice I will accomplish nothing, since you are far stronger. Yet my labour also should not be let go unaccomplished, I am likewise a god, and my race is even what yours is, and I am first of the daughters of devious devising Kronos, both ways, since I am eldest born and am called your consort, yours, and you in turn are lord over all the immortals. Come then, in this thing let us both give way to each other, I to you, you to me, and so the rest of the immortal gods will follow. Now in speed give orders to Athene to visit horrible war again on Achaeans and Trojans, and try to make it so that the Trojans are first off-enders to do injury against the oaths to the far-famed Achaeans. She spoke, nor did the father of gods and men disobey her, but immediately he spoke in winged words to Athene, go now swiftly to the host of the Achaeans and Trojans and try to make it so that the Trojans are first off-enders to do injury against the oaths to the far-famed Achaeans. Speaking so he stirred up Athene, who was eager before this, and she went in a flash of speed down the pinnacles of Olympos. As when the son of devious devising Kronos casts down a star, portent to sailors or to widespread armies of peoples glittering, and thickly the sparks of fire break from it, in such likeness Pallas Athene swept flashing earthward and plunged between the two hosts, an amazement seized the beholders, Trojans, breakers of horses, and strong grieved Achaeans. And thus they would speak to each other, each looking at the man next him, surely again there will be evil war and terrible fighting, or else now friendship is being set between both sides by Zeus, who is appointed lord of the wars of mortals. Thus would murmur any man, Achaean or Trojan. She in the likeness of a man merged among the Trojans assembled, Laodokos, Antinor's son, a powerful spearman, searching for godlike Pandaros, if she might somewhere come on him. She found the son of Lycaon, a man blameless and powerful, standing still, and about him were the ranks of strong, shield-armoured people, who had followed him from the streams of Isipos. 
Speaking in winged words she stood beside him and spoke to him, Why son of Lycaon, would you now let me persuade you? So you might dare send a flying arrow against Menelaus and win you glory and gratitude in the sight of all Trojans, particularly beyond all else with Prince Alexandros. Beyond all beside you would carry away glorious gifts from him, were he to see warlike Menelaus, the son of Atreus, struck down by your arrow, and laid on the sorrowful corpse fire. Come then, let go an arrow against haughty Menelaus, but make your prayer to Apollo the Lightborn, the glorious archer, that you will accomplish a grand sacrifice of lambs firstborn when you come home again to the city of sacred Zelea. So spoke Athene, and persuaded the fool's heart in him. Straightway he unwrapped his bow, of the polished horn from a running wild goat he himself had shot in the chest once, lying in wait for the goat in a covert as it stepped down from the rock, and hit it in the chest so it sprawled on the boulders. The horns that grew from the goat's head were sixteen palms length. A bowyer working on the horn then bound them together, smoothing them to a fair surface, and put on a golden string hook. Pandaros strung his bow and put it in position, bracing it against the ground, and his brave friends held their shields in front of him for fear the warlike sons of the Achaeans might rise up and rush him before he had struck warlike Menelaus, the son of Atreus. He stripped away the lid of the quiver, and took out an arrow feathered, and never shot before, transmitter of dark pain. Swiftly he arranged the bitter arrow along the bowstring, and made his prayer to Apollo the Lightborn, the glorious archer, that he would accomplish a grand sacrifice of lambs firstborn when he came home again to the city of sacred Zelea. He drew, holding at once the grooves and the oxhide bowstring, and brought the string against his nipple, iron to the bow stave. But when he had pulled the great weapon till it made a circle, the bow groaned, and the string sang high, and the arrow, sharp pointed, leapt away, furious, to fly through the throng before it. Still the blessed gods immortal did not forget you, Menelaus, and first among them Zeus' daughter, the spoiler, who standing in front of you fended aside the tearing arrow. She brushed it away from his skin as lightly as when a mother brushes a fly away from her child who is lying in sweet sleep, steering herself the arrow's course straight to where the golden belt buckles joined and the halves of his corslet were fitted together. The bitter arrow was driven against the joining of the war belt and passed clean through the war belt elaborately woven, into the elaborately wrought corslet the shaft was driven and the guard which he wore to protect his skin and keep the spears off, which guarded him best, yet the arrow plunged even through this also and with the very tip of its point it grazed the man's skin and straightway from the cut there gushed a cloud of dark blood. As when some Ionian woman or Carian with purple colours ivory, to make it a cheap piece for horses, it lies away in an inner room, and many a rider longs to have it, but it is laid up to be a king's treasure, two things, to be the beauty of the horse, the pride of the horseman, so, Menelaus, your shapely thighs were stained with the colour of blood, and your legs also and the ankles beneath them. Agamemnon the lord of men was taken with shuddering fear as he saw how from the cut the dark blood trickled downward, and Menelaus the warlike himself shuddered in terror, but when he saw the binding strings and the hooked barbs outside the wound, his spirit was gathered again back into him. Agamemnon the powerful spoke to them, groaning heavily, and by the hand held Menelaus, while their companions were mourning beside them, Dear brother, it was your death I sealed in the odes of friendship, setting you alone before the Achaeans to fight with the Trojans. So, the Trojans have struck you down and trampled on the odes sworn. Still the odes and the blood of the lambs shall not be called vain, the unmixed wine poured and the right hands we trusted. If the Olympian at once has not finished this matter, late will he bring it to pass, and they must pay a great penalty, with their own heads, and with their women, and with their children. For I know this thing well in my heart, and my mind knows it. There will come a day when sacred Ilion shall perish, and Priam, and the people of Priam of the strong ash spear, and Zeus son of Kronos who sits on high, the sky-dwelling. Himself shall shake the gloom of his aegis over all of them in anger for this deception. All this shall not go unaccomplished. But I shall suffer a terrible grief for you, Menelaus, if you die and fill out the destiny of your lifetime. And I must return a thing of reproach to Argos the thirsty, for now at once the Achaeans will remember the land of their fathers, and thus we would leave to Priam and to the Trojans Helen of Argos, to glory over, while the bones of you rot in the plowland as you lie dead in Troy, on a venture that went unaccomplished. And thus shall some Trojan speak in the proud show of his manhood, leaping lightly as he speaks on the tomb of great Menelaus, might Agamemnon accomplish his anger thus against all his enemies, as now he led here in vain a host of Achaeans and has gone home again to the beloved land of his fathers with ships empty, and leaving behind him brave Menelaus. Thus shall a man speak, then let the wide earth open to take me. 
Then in encouragement fair-haired Menelo spoke to him, Do not fear, nor yet make afraid the Achaean people. The sharp arrow is not stuck in a mortal place, but the shining war belt turned it aside from its course, and the flap beneath it with my guard of armor that bronze smiths wrought carefully for me. Then in answer again spoke powerful Agamemnon, May it only be as you say, O Menelos, dear brother. But the physician will handle the wound and apply over it healing salves, by which he can put an end to the black pains. He spoke, and addressed Tolthibios, his sacred herald, Tolthibios, with all speed go call hither Machaon, a man who is son of Asclepios and a blameless physician, so that he may look at Menelos, the warlike son of Atreus, whom someone skilled in the bows you shot with an arrow, Trojan or Lycian, glory to him, but to us a sorrow. He spoke, and the herald heard and did not disobey him, but went on his way among the host of bronze-armored Achaeans looking about for the warrior Machaon, and saw him standing still, and about him the strong ranks of shield-bearing people, who had come with him from horse-pasturing Tricker. He came and stood close beside him and addressed him in winged words, Rise up, son of Asclepios, powerful Agamemnon calls you, so that you may look at warlike Menelos, the Achaean's leader, whom someone skilled in the bows you shot with an arrow, Trojan or Lycian, glory to him, but to us a sorrow. So he spoke, and stirred up the spirit within Machaon. They went through the crowd along the widespread host of the Achaeans. But when they had come to the place where fair-haired Menelos had been hit, where all the great men were gathered about him in a circle, and he stood in the midst of them, a man godlike, straightway he pulled the arrow forth from the joining of the war belt, and as it was pulled out the sharp barbs were broken backward. He slipped open the war belt then and the flap beneath it with the guard of armor that bronze smiths wrought carefully for him. But when he saw the wound where the bitter arrow was driven, he sucked the blood and in skill laid healing medicines on it that Cheyenne in friendship long ago had given his father. While they were working over Menelos of the Great War cry all this time came on the ranks of the armored Trojans. The Achaeans again put on their armor, and remembered their warcraft. Then you would not have seen brilliant Agamemnon asleep nor skulking aside, nor in any way a reluctant fighter, but driving eagerly toward the fighting where men win glory. He left aside his chariot gleaming with bronze, and his horses, and these, breathing hard, were held aside by a henchman, Eurymedon, born to Ptolemaios, the son of Peiraios. Agamemnon told him to keep them well in hand, till the time came when weariness might take hold of his limbs, through marshalling so many. Then he, on foot as he was, ranged through the ranks of his fighters. Those of the fast-mounted Danans he found eager, he would stand beside these and urge them harder on with words spoken, Argives, do not let go now of this furious valor. Zeus the father shall not be one to give aid to liars, but these, who were the first to do violence over the oath sworn, vultures shall feed upon the delicate skin of their bodies, while we lead away their beloved wives and innocent children, in our ships, after we have stormed their citadel. Any he might see hanging back from the hateful conflict these in words of anger he would reproach very bitterly, Argives, you arrow fighters, have you no shame, you disgraces? Why are you simply standing there bewildered, like young deer who after they are tired from running through a great meadow stand there still, and there is no heart of courage within them? Thus are you standing still bewildered and are not fighting? Or are you waiting for the Trojans to come close, where the strong stern ships have been hauled up along the strand of the grey sea, so you may know if Crono's son will hold his hand over you? Thus he ranged through the ranks of his men and set them in order. On his way through the thronging men he came to the Cretans who about valiant Idomeneus were arming for battle. Idomeneus, like a boar in his strength, stood among the champions while Merion still urged along the last battalions. Agamemnon the lord of men was glad as he looked at them and in words of graciousness at once spoke to Idomeneus, I honor you, Idomeneus, beyond the fast-mounted Danans whether in battle, or in any action whatever, whether it be at the feast, when the great men of the Argives blend in the mixing bowl the gleaming wine of the princes. Even though all the rest of the flowing haired Achaeans drink out their portion, still your cup stands filled forever even as mine, for you to drink when the pleasure takes you. Rise up then to battle, be such as you claimed in time past. Then in turn Idomeneus lord of the Cretans answered him, Son of Atreus, I will in truth be a staunch companion in arms, as first I promised you and bent my head to it. Rouse up rather the rest of the flowing haired Achaean so that we may fight in all speed, since the Trojans have broken their oaths, a thing that shall be death and sorrow hereafter to them, since they were the first to do violence over the oath sworn. So he spoke, and Atreides, cheerful at heart, went onward. On his way through the thronging men he came to the Aeantes. These were armed, and about them went a cloud of foot soldiers. 
as from his watching place a goat herd watches a cloud move on its way over the sea before the drive of the west wind, far away though he be he watches it, blacker than pitches, moving across the sea and piling the storm before it, and as he sees it he shivers and drives his flocks to a cavern, so about the two aantes moved the battalions, close compacted of strong and god-supported young fighters, black, and jagged with spear and shield, to the terror of battle. Agamemnon the lord of men was glad when he looked at them, and he spoke aloud to them and addressed them in winged words, Aeantes, O leaders of the bronze-armoured Argives, to you too I give no orders, it would not become me to speed you, now that yourselves drive your people on to fight strongly. Father Zeus, and Athene, and Apollo, if only such a spirit were in the hearts of all of my people. Then perhaps the city of Lord Priam would be bent underneath our hands, captured and utterly taken. So he spoke, and left them there, and went among others. There he came upon Nestor, the lucid speaker of Pylos, setting in order his own companions and urging them to battle, tall Pelagon with those about him, Alastor and Chromios, Hymon the powerful, and Bias, shepherd of the people. In front he ranged the mounted men with their horses and chariots, and stationed the brave and numerous foot soldiers behind them to be the bastion of battle, and drove the cowards to the centre so that a man might be forced to fight even though unwilling. First he gave orders to the drivers of horses, and warned them to hold their horses in check and not be fouled in the multitude, let no man in the pride of his horsemanship and his manhood dare to fight alone with the Trojans in front of the rest of us, neither let him give ground, since that way you will be weaker. When a man from his own car encounters the enemy chariots let him stab with his spear, since this is the stronger fighting. So the men before your time sacked tower and city, keeping a spirit like this in their hearts, and like this their purpose. Thus the old man wise in fighting from of old encouraged them. Agamemnon the lord of men was glad when he looked at him and he spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words, Aged sir, if only, as the spirit is in your bosom, so might your knees be also and the strength stay steady within you, but age weakens you which comes to all, if only some other of the fighters had your age and you were one of the young men. Nestor the Gerenian horseman spoke and answered him, Son of Atreus, so would I also wish to be that man I was, when I cut down brilliant Eruthalian. But the gods give to mortals not everything at the same time, if I was a young man then, now in turn old age is upon me. Yet even so I shall be among the riders, and command them with word and counsel, such is the privilege of the old men. The young spearmen shall do the spear fighting, those who are born of a generation later than mine, who trust in their own strength. So he spoke, and Atreides, cheerful at heart, went onward. He came on the son of Petios, Menestheus, driver of horses, standing still, and about him the Athenians, urgent for battle. Next to these resourceful Odysseus had taken position, and beside him the Cephalenian ranks, no weak ones, were standing, since the men had not heard the clamour of battle but even now fresh set in motion the battalions moved of Achaeans and Trojans, breakers of horses, so these standing waited, until some other mass of Achaeans advancing might crash against the Trojans, and the battle be opened. Seeing these the lord of men Agamemnon scolded them and spoke aloud to them and addressed them in winged words, saying, Son of Petios, the king supported by God, and you, too, you with your mind forever on profit and your ways of treachery, why do you stand here skulking aside, and wait for the others? For you too it is becoming to stand among the foremost fighters, and endure your share of the blaze of battle, since indeed you too are first to hear of the feasting whenever we Achaeans make ready a feast of the princes. There it is your pleasure to eat the roast flesh, to drink as much as you please the cups of the wine that is sweet as honey. Now, though, you would be pleased to look on though ten battalions of Achaeans were to fight with the pitiless bronze before you. Then looking at him darkly resourceful Odysseus spoke to him, What is this word that broke through the fence of your teeth, Atreides? How can you say that, when we Achaeans waken the bitter war god on Trojans, breakers of horses, I hang back from fighting? Only watch, if you care to and if it concerns you, the very father of Telemachos locked with the champion Trojans, breakers of horses. Your talk is wind, and no meaning. Powerful Agamemnon in turn answered him, laughing, seeing that he was angered and taking back the word spoken, son of Let's and seed of Zeus, resourceful Odysseus, I must not be niggling with you, nor yet give you orders, since I know how the spirit in your secret heart knows ideas of kindness only, for what you think is what I think. Come now, I will make it good hereafter, if anything evil has been said, let the gods make all this come to nothing. So he spoke, and left him there, and went among others. He came on the son of Tydeus, high-spirited Diams, standing among the compacted chariots and by the horses, and Capaneus' son, Sthenelos, was standing beside him. 
At sight of Diams the lord of men Agamemnon scolded him and spoke aloud to him and addressed him in winged words, saying, Ah me, son of Tydeus, that daring breaker of horses, why are you skulking and spying out the outworks of battle? Such was never Tydeus' way, to lurk in the background, but to fight the enemy far ahead of his own companions. So they say who had seen him at work, since I never saw nor encountered him ever, but they say he surpassed all others. Once on a time he came, but not in war, to Mike and I with godlike Polynex, a guest and a friend, assembling people, since these were attacking the sacred bastions of Thabe, and much they entreated us to grant him renowned companions. And our men wished to give them and were assenting to what they asked for but Zeus turned them back, showing forth portents that crossed them. Now as these went forward and were well on their way, and came to the river Asopos, and the meadows of grass and the deep rushes, from there the Achaeans sent Tydeus ahead with a message. He went then and came on the Cadmians in their numbers feasting all about the house of mighty Aetiocles. There, stranger though he was, the driver of horses, Tydeus, was not frightened, alone among so many Cadmians, but dared them to try their strength with him, and bested all of them easily, such might did Pallas Athene give him. The Cadmians who lashed their horses, in anger compacted an ambuscade of guile on his way home, assembling together fifty fighting men, and for these there were two leaders, Mayan, Hymen's son, in the likeness of the immortals, with the son of Autophanos, Polyphon stubborn in battle. On these men Tydeus let loose a fate that was shameful. He killed them all, except that he let one man get home again, letting Mayan go in obedience to the god signs. This was Tydeus, the Aetolian, yet he was father to a son worse than himself at fighting, better in conclave. So he spoke, and strong Diams gave no answer in or before the majesty of the king's rebuking, but the son of Caponius the Glorious answered him, saying, Son of Atreus, do not lie when you know the plain truth. We too claim we are better men by far than our fathers. We did storm the seven-gated foundation of they though we led fewer people beneath a wall that was stronger. We obeyed the signs of the gods and the help Zeus gave us, while those others died of their own headlong stupidity. Therefore, never liken our fathers to us in honour. Then looking at him darkly strong Diam spoke to him, Friend, stay quiet rather and do as I tell you, I will find no fault with Agamemnon, shepherd of the people, for stirring thus into battle the strong grieved Achaeans, this will be his glory to come, if ever the Achaeans cut down the men of Troy and capture sacred Ilion. If the Achaeans are slain, then his will be the great sorrow. Come, let you and me remember our fighting courage. He spoke and leapt in all his gear to the ground from the chariot, and the bronze armor girt to the chest of the king clashed terribly as he sprang. Fear would have gripped even a man stout-hearted. As when along the thundering beach the surf of the sea strikes beat upon beat as the west wind drives it onward, far out cresting first on the open water, it drives thereafter to smash roaring along the dry land, and against the rock jut bending breaks itself into crest spewing back the salt wash, so throng beat upon beat the Danans close battalion steadily into battle, with each of the lords commanding his own men, and these went silently, you would not think all these people with voices. Kept in their chests were marching, silently, in fear of their commanders, and upon all glittered as they marched the shining armour they carried. But the Trojans, a sheep in a man of possession steading stand in their myriads waiting to be drained of their white milk and bleat interminably as they hear the voice of their lambs, so the crying of the Trojans went up through the wide army. Since there was no speech nor language common to all of them but their talk was mixed, who were called there from many far places. Ars drove these on, and the Achaeans grey-eyed Athene, and terror drove them, and fear, and hate whose wrath is relentless, she the sister and companion of murderous Ars, she who is only a little thing at the first, but thereafter grows until she strides on the earth with her head striking heaven. She then hurled down bitterness equally between both sides as she walked through the onslaught making men's pain heavier. Now as these advancing came to one place and encountered, they dashed their shields together and their spears, and the strength of armoured men in bronze, and the shields massive in the middle clashed against each other, and the sound grew huge of the fighting. There the screaming and the shouts of triumph rose up together of men killing and men killed, and the ground ran blood. As when rivers in winter spate running down from the mountains throw together at the meeting of streams the weight of their water out of the great springs behind in the hollow stream bed, and far away in the mountains the shepherd hears their thunder, such, from the coming together of men, was the shock and the shouting. Antilochos was first to kill a chief man of the Trojans, valiant among the champions, Thalysia's son, Echepolos. 
Throwing first, he struck the horn of the horse-haired helmet, and the bronze spearpoint fixed in his forehead and drove inward through the bone, and a mist of darkness clouded both eyes and he fell as a tower falls in the strong encounter. As he dropped, Elefina the powerful caught him by the feet, Chalkadan's son, and lord of the great-hearted Abance, and dragged him away from under the missiles, striving in all speed to strip the armor from him, yet his outrush went short-lived. For as he hauled the corpse high-hearted Agenor, marking the ribs that showed bare under the shield as he bent over, stabbed with the bronze-pointed spear and unstrung his sinews. So the spirit left him and over his body was fought out weary work by Trojans and Achaeans, who like wolves sprang upon one another, with man against man in the onfall. Their Telamonian ire struck down the son of Anthemian Simoasios in his stripling's beauty, whom once his mother descending from Ida bore beside the banks of Simoas when she had followed her father and mother to tend the sheep flocks. Therefore they called him Simoasios, but he could not render again the care of his dear parents, he was short-lived, beaten down beneath the spear of high-hearted Ias, who struck him as he first came forward beside the nipple of the right breast, and the bronze spearhead drove clean through the shoulder. He dropped then to the ground in the dust, like some black poplar, which in the land low lying about a great marsh grow smooth trimmed yet with branches growing at the uttermost treetop, one whom a man, a maker of chariots, fells with the shining iron, to bend it into a wheel for a fine wrought chariot, and the tree lies hardening by the banks of a river. Such was Anthemian's son Simoasios, whom illustrious Ias killed. Now Antiphos of the shining corslet, Priam's son, made a cast at him in the crowd with the sharp spear but missed Ias and struck Leucos, a brave companion of Odysseus, in the groin, as he dragged a corpse off, so that the body dropped from his hand as he fell above it. For his killing Odysseus was stirred to terrible anger and he strode out among the champions, helmed in bright bronze, and stood close to the enemy hefting the shining javelin, glaring round about him, and the Trojans gave way in the face of the man throwing with the spear. And he made no vain cast, but struck down Demacoon, a son of Priam, a bastard, who came over from Abydos, and left his fast-running horses. Odysseus struck him with the spear, in anger for his companion, in the temple, and the bronze spearhead drove through the other temple also, so that a mist of darkness clouded both eyes. He fell, thunderously, and his armor clattered upon him. The champions of Troy gave back then, and glorious Hector, and the Argives gave a great cry, and dragged back the bodies, and drove their way far forward, but now Apollo watching from high Pergamos was angered, and called aloud to the Trojans, Rise up, Trojans, breakers of horses, bend not from battle with these Argives. Surely their skin is not stone, not iron to stand up under the tearing edge of the bronze as it strikes them. No, nor is Achilles the child of lovely haired that he's fighting, but beside the ship mulls his heart saw anger. So called the fearful god from the citadel, while Zeus' daughter Tritogenia, goddess most high, drove on the Achaeans, any of them she saw hanging back as she strode through the battle. Now his doom caught fast Amarynchia's son Dior's, who with a jagged boulder was smitten beside the ankle in the right shin, and a lord of the Thracian warriors threw it, Peiros, son of Imbrasos, who had journeyed from Ainos. The pitiless stone smashed utterly the tendons on both sides with the bones, and he was hurled into the dust backward reaching out both hands to his own beloved companions, gasping life out, the stone's thrower ran up beside him, Peiros, and stabbed with his spear next the navel, and all his guts poured out on the ground, and a mist of darkness closed over both eyes. Though as the Aetolian hit Peiros as he ran backward with the spear in the chest above the nipple, and the bronze point fixed in the lung, and Thoa standing close dragged out the heavy spear from his chest, and drawing his sharp sword struck him in the middle of the belly, and so took the life from him, yet did not strip his armor, for his companions about him stood, Thracians with hair grown at the top, gripping their long spears, and though he was a mighty man and a strong and proud one thrust him from them so that he gave ground backward, staggering. So in the dust these two lay sprawled beside one another, lords, the one of the Thracians, the other of the bronze-armored Epeans, and many others beside were killed all about them. There no more could a man who was in that work make light of it, one who still unhit and still unstabbed by the sharp bronze spun in the midst of that fighting, with Pallas Athene's hold on his hand guiding him, driving back the volleying spears thrown. For on that day many men of the Achaeans and Trojans lay sprawled in the dust face downward beside one another.